Hello, welcome to the Wrong Game. I'm your host, Rob, campaign Rob today, uh, and I'm joined by what a gorgeous individual. Like, super excited to have him back on the show. No, don't look around. We know it's you, Mister. Uh, drum roll, please. Twitch chat. Henry Steele from the Coat of Paint. Hello, sir. How are you? Hi. Uh, you're all right. Hi, mate. Hi, everyone. Are you, are you well? I'm very well, thanks. But how are you? Uh, I'm very excited to have you on the show. Uh, loads to loads to unpack from what you've been up to recently. Uh, always yeah. nice for me to ask lots of questions like, oh, "Blue's a great color, isn't it?" You know, classic. Uh, <laughs> someone the other day was it like, is. "Why don't you? Why don't you interview more great. painters, Rob?" And it was like, "Because I don't know anything to ask. Like, I also don't have neuroscientists on. Because I'd be like, brains, they're cool, eh? What you got? Like, <laughs> just got to think about it's just hobby, isn't it? It's just, it's just all the, all those things you couldn't be bothered to sit down and research or like figure out how to do just ask because that's that's what we do basically yeah we sit exactly. and do all that yeah but i'm very looking i'm really looking forward to hearing about what you've got going on recently because it seems like it's really exciting and generally just have a hangout and do some chatting uh which we got i, I just want to say so. a big shout out to everyone on the chat uh what's going on tristan sorry again Stu flynn on oh, 15 seconds early today uh it's because henry's Stu flynn uh, yeah, stuff Lynn. Oh. <laughs> That's who he is. Oh, there's a question. Do you mind if I just take it quick before we get on? Um, okay, okay. In the KO okay. time, it states that they use their gold whenever they like, uh, as they could a triumph. But a triumph usage needs to be declared when activating the unit. So by using the gold in that matter, could I use a triumph? I can't use it after I've seen a bunch of ones. As everybody's their granny player. You can, it, like, irregardless of like whatever wording you want to like look at or not look at. Um, uh, effectively, KO eighth, the gold that they have as a resource on each one of their units is usable at whenever they decide they want to use it. So you could you could take all of your um, uh, you could like for instance like a lot of it time you see it used on an ironclad. The ironclad you could roll all your saves against the ironclad. You can see oh you've made a bunch of buds uh, a bunch of bad saves and you can use a triumph to reroll saves. I know it's a weird and janky way it works, but it's it's rules as written. That's the way it works. So boring but there you go apologies about that big shout out to gary powell in the chat yes yes gary downstairs is the man who runs our 3d print well not our but the the, the venue carpe ludum where t sports arena is above he's down there and he does all 3d printing all day he's does 3D he? printing cool. things. Yeah, yeah he's got a 3d print form it's quite cool actually there's there's him who does all the 3d printing and then there's curtis and ratty and they have uh a uh, traditional sculpting. It's, it's, I mean, it's amazing for me to come into in the morning. They're uh, they're sculpting like these awesome little models, and they're like, "What do you think of this? I just made it." And I'm like, <laughs> "What with your hands? That's insane!" Uh, and then they also, like actual um, like a, a miniatures 3D printing place. Oh no! So the 3D printing is like your more traditional like. So the 3D printing part Gary does is more your traditional like. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of people now who are doing um, licensing. Is that right? Yeah. Licensing. So they're, they're designing models and then someone like Gary yeah. is like, um, or he's like, you know, if you've bought some SDLs, he'll print them for you sort of a yeah. situation, yeah. which I think is a really clever idea. Yeah. 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 So it started uh, with Shapeways, didn't it? And now now it, the 3D printers have taken such a such a jump in the last 12 months that even your sort of considered budget home printers, now you can knock out really decent looking things on. Um, so, you know, if you've got a, a high spec printer, then... Yeah, you're laughing. Should be printing all day long. Yeah, it was actually a, a, a conversation that I was having last night with James because uh, we were talking about uh, getting the um, terrain done for the TSN yeah. Arena for, just for our like regular events mm. sort of a situation. And uh, I was like, I'm just going to like smash it out of like um, bits and pieces here and there and try and design something really nice. And then me, James was like, well, like let's let's have a genuine conversation about how much money we would spend on like raw materials versus how much a, a 3D printer costs. And it was just like, well, you know, it's um it's it's getting very very applicable like yeah especially well, especially your um the fdm the the ones that you would use for printing scenery um yeah. particularly they're so they're so inexpensive to buy and to fuel um that if it goes wrong you've just wasted a bit of time um, but there, there are so many great sort of patreons and kickstarters of people doing fantasy scenery probably sci-fi stuff as well i don't know but um like fantasy scenery get get yourself uh, uh, yeah i think it's the fdm the one that extrudes the resin not the one that like pulls it up like terminator 2 from the goop and uh and yeah just one of those and uh, there's a guy on twitter anthony something um pull anthony pull castro 
Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Crazy Horse he's, is in, yes, in the chat. Yeah, he's got like a thousand of these printers just constantly running, now, hasn't he? There's always some smashing looking new fantasy house or something he's made. But yeah, for your sort of venue or for a gaming club, I think it's a no brainer now. That's um, yeah, I, I really do think it's I think it's like an absolute no brainer. Like yeah. especially for like especially uh, at the moment. I'm sorry this isn't anything to do with what you're doing like but it's just come up especially uh, uh, especially at the moment um because you know especially like so specifically if you're talking 40k like mm. 40k is going through such like a revolution with exactly oh big goldfish thanks for subscribing love you tons uh jog plc thanks for donating 100 bits as well uh loads of loads of love uh thanks everyone for joining us as well especially at the moment like 40k is going through a kind of like not revolution that's the wrong way of like looking at it but it's going through um like a big change not only in like board space like with the actual yeah. tables and mats so people are having to reinvest a lot of money if they're wanting to like convert and i'm pretty certain that's going to happen with age sigma and then um you, they're in this big conversation about terrain as well terrain is so mm. important in 40k mm. so functional and really there isn't any specifics you've had like things like warzone atlanta recently where the terrain was like this kind of like it the conversation about warzone atlanta was because of the terrain they were using player pace terrain oh, right. really massive bits sometimes you couldn't move things all across the board mm. uh all the way to terrains where it's like a fucking sheet of ice you know like it's just open field <laughs> oh, what, got... the same event no no different events oh, different right. events but what i more mean is um the the parity for events for terrain now age sigma doesn't necessarily yeah. have that conversation yet but i'm pretty certain it's going to have that next year with age sigma 3 so i think at the moment as people are, are looking at that you, i mean you've been massively involved in creating boards and and models and armies your whole life what's what's been yeah, your I approach I reckon I've done about 30 or so table commissions over the years. Wow. Um, but but my approach is paint what the customer wants me to. I don't, I've, 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 have I ever had a board? I don't think I've ever had my own board. I've never had my own space to, to game at home. So I've never, mm. I, I have now, but obviously COVID. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's always just been paint, painting for people. But I think... You know, I, I'm not a competitive gamer by well, as, as in I'm not a tournament gamer by any means. Mm. But I follow the scene quite closely, and it's it's a really interesting place they're in right now, isn't it? Because as a as someone who enjoys very immersive games at the club or or someone's house or whatever, the terrain it's not always more is better, but often it's more is better, right? Or certainly choice and variety mm. makes a far more interesting game. Like we we play a lot of we played a lot of Titanicus before lockdown. Uh, for about a year or so and we used to play on really heavily congested tables with really you know tall tall buildings that would block a warlord titan and all that sort of thing and it, it made they were meant they were games really based around movement and firing lanes and, and things like that which is why i enjoy that sort of that's when it gets competitive right mm -hmm. but it was incredibly immersive as well but then i went to an event uh, Titanicus event and it was much more varied and certainly never was the terrain as dense as what we were using and it was a different game and that's a game with five-ish models in like I can only imagine when people are bringing these very honed sort of lists that, that terrain must have an enormous impact you know and if it would suck wouldn't it to go to an event and, and basically be screwed over by the terrain I, I think I think it really hasn't like it hasn't been a like really like hard and fast conversation with loads of impetus behind it. You know, someone would be like, "Oh, I've got, I've got an event," and you're like, "Cool," and you go, and they're like, "Sorry, I couldn't afford those trains." It's like, "Oh, that's fine," but like, kind of isn't, you know, sort of a situation. And then like, yeah, it, like, yeah. and then and then like, and then that keeps, and you can really understand the conversation. You can, you can. Um, and I think that's why you see a lot of people like a lot of people are working towards those goals. And I think there's there's lots to break. There's, it's just, it's you, just can a, have a, you can do a whole show on that in and of itself. Just, um, yeah. yeah, it's fascinating. I guess it's that thing is if, if you're going to because it's all well and good asking people to bring terrain with them, you know, and I know like, so I was a big part of the heresy community for a long time. And mm. the whole idea of you would you would bring terrain with you to events to help out, because, again, Whilst they were competitive games, that wasn't usually the point. Heresy events tended not to be a tournament, so your wins and losses didn't really count for more than just bragging rights. So again, if you if somebody brought a very dense table and then somebody brought 
like you said, a, a glacier or something, it didn't matter as much. What mattered was it was a cool looking table. Yeah. I think when it's when you're going and it's competitive and ranked and all of that, you kind of need it to be as similar as possible, right? On every table. And I think if you're if you're asking people to bring stuff at that point, it's a bit tricky, right? They're already yeah, paid I, however much to come to the tournament. Agreed. And I think the other like really interesting factor is which we I was so proud we were able to do for the Super Series is we managed to make functional terrain. And again, shout out to all of the people who helped. Dark Fantastic Mills, uh, Studio Earthward, all you guys. Anthony himself sent over a whole box of terrain. So oh, massive nice. love to him. Um, uh, Wallace for, for designing his own board. So like, you know, we were able to make functional terrain that was also pretty looking. And that mm. is... Like, that's the kind of, like, the next step. And you can... Yay, oh, puppy! Po- postman's here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, like, less of that. Right, so how have you been? Catch us up. What have you been up to? Because there was... You, you were launching a lot of stuff last time we spoke to you. Yeah, uh, yeah. We've so seen it online. What's been going on? When I, when I came... When I was on last, it was quite... I think... Maybe it was, like, a early 100s or something like that. Um, I can't remember. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was earlier. All I know is it wasn't 69, and it was close to 69. Oh, my God. You should have waited for the next one. A lot. <laughs> but, um, but, yeah, so I uh, think so around that. Yeah, maybe it was earlier. So, uh, yeah, we just started up the YouTube and the Patreon uh, channels because we weren't able to teach anymore uh, in person. Um, and they've been going great. They've been going strength to strength. Um, and recently... Uh, this weekend just gone we just finished our first kickstarter for a, a range of models um and that went really well so i'm really pleased about that now it's the frantic well kickstarter is a horrible thing like the actual uh software i guess you call it like it's just a nightmare so now it's sort of dealing with the back end of it so that we can present people with now they can pick all their toys that they want to do um, is, it, is it like it's hard to like take the information that you've generated out of it into your own format or is it like it's sort, just really sort of, un- honestly it's like they give you a microsoft word document with basically no options other right. than bold and italic and insert an image and then you've got to make the thing but then when it comes to and people pledge but then when it comes to people actually uh buying stuff and choosing stuff and picking additional extras so say like we're gonna do our sci-fi miniatures range as a thing that you can add on at a reduced price at the end of it type of thing. And yeah. you've got to do that via a different piece of software that's nothing to do with Kickstarter. And it's it's just it's just when you when you it's a bit like Skype, right? <laughs> it's, they've basically gone, ah, whatever. Like it's worked fine for 10 years. We'll just leave it how it is. Um so I think that's just what Kickstarter has done. But it's yeah. um but, you know, I, I think once you got that name recognition as well, like there's also, I think one of the things when like people pledge money, I think mm-hmm. like, you know, Kickstarter, uh, uh, I know it's had its controversies, but you're also, you're buying into the, um, the brand of Kickstarter and you think, well, they're not going to yeah. let some like, some like cowboys like rip me off. This, there should be some sort of identification. I'm not sure if that's necessarily the case. Possibly. But... I mean, we really, we really undenied about Kickstarter for a long time for, for many sorts of reasons. Um, but actually it was someone on, on a class who just said, come on, it's, you're the sort of people it's designed for. You know, you want to do this little boutique thing. You need the, the readies to be able to, to do it properly and do it well. You know, why don't you do it? Um, so we did. Uh, and it went, yeah, and it went really well, man. It was, it was a, a really interesting experience. Um, so that was, yeah, it was the day of God kickstarter so we made a load uh some 54 millimeter uh elf models mm-hmm. really uh, pretty but yeah it's gone it's gone great man like i re- really enjoyed it like it was a bit odd because we we the creative process for that kickstarter was three years ago so really you know, we 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 had the finished sculpts as it were not the actual models because they don't exist bar the couple of masters um but we we saw the sculpts a year ago and then we just sat, you know, so it's been really nice to finally get excited about it again, sort of as, as people are seeing it for the first time. They get excited and then you, oh, yeah, it is really cool, isn't it? And then you can sort of go uh, go and enjoy it again. Um, but no, yeah, it's been really good fun, man. So I think that's, I think that's, yes, that's what's happened since. That since. I mean, it's, it's exciting. So I'd like to ask you, like, your reasoning behind, like, wanting to get into it because I know that there'll be a lot of actual there's going to be a lot behind there because knowing you that that'll be the case there has been some questions though 
Um, you mean Old uh, Waffle? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, chat, big shout out to Diffie or Adam. I'm not sure who's in the chat, uh, who's based over in Australia. Uh, who said he'll be going to your class if you ever make it back to Oz. Um, yeah, man, we should be. I think we should have been there now. Actually, what are we in November? Yeah, we should have been there around now. Sad times. I, I know. I was twice this year. I was, I was going to. I was very. Look, I was going to uh, Queensland this year uh, mm. to see to see all the boys over there, like my Brisbane boys. I was gutted, gutted. Very. I was very, very hyped to go see those guys. Anyway, soon. I had the worst flu in my life in Brisbane. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Somebody brought it on the class uh, I was at, and. <laughs> Uh, like hallucinations, everything, and like going in and trying to teach. <laughs> like, oh, you had it while you were trying to teach classes. Yeah, so it was a five-day class, and uh, one of the yeah one of the students uh, brought it over from Perth. Uh, it was known as the Wasteland Flu, and uh, it just started. So we, I think, I started with twenty-five people on the class. And we finished with less than twenty. They didn't <laughs> die, but they they didn't make it to the to the end because they got this flu and just bless them, bless them. <laughs> yeah, that's basically my memory of Brisbane. Um, and then and then sort of you know, getting tickets to a really big rugby match that was on and not being able to go. Um, and then just sitting in the cinema because it was like the best air conditioning place and watching the new Blade Runner. Oh, nice! Just completely spaced out. So I, I did that. Just, I went oh. to I went to the cinema um, in I went to cinema in uh, Sydney. I think so I was in Australia traveling. This is not one of the times I went over for work. But I was wearing like just shorts, yeah, and a t shirt, <laughs> and I brought nothing else with me. And and obviously cinemas are like air conditioned, right? So I was just freezing. <laughs> but but it turned out like because it was the showing of like something that I really wanted to see, but like I can't remember what it was now. Something I really wanted to see, but there was like. Um, uh, like it, there was only this one showing before I had to travel somewhere else. So I went in, and it turned. They were like, it was like a couple of extra dollars because they were like, oh, you know, this is the the women's one. And I was like, I don't know what it means. Like, sure. Mm. So sat in, and then like there was like a fifteen minute presentation at the start where they were giving out like various like beauty products to random <laughs> people in the crowd. They're like seat seventy eight, and I was <laughs> like, please Jesus, do not call me up. <laughs> 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 oh, dear. I just sat there freezing. Like this is the, <laughs> this is the worst experience of my life. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, a couple of questions I had in the chat. Um, uh, Henry is uh, out of the new models that you uh, um, uh, yeah. have made. Do you have a favourite? Oh, uh, me and Andy would like we flip flop daily probably on them. But I think I think probably the executioner model. So the the woman with the bit, well, the female elf with the big spear and the big snake uh cloak behind her um yeah probably her just because i think she was she's a big imposing model and i think she's a very good representation of what we were trying to do with the range which is this idea of trying to show elves from just different cultures really um rather than your, your high elf dark elf wood elf tropes um we wanted just to try and explore it a bit and and she was uh, it's, um, it's not purely like ripping off one area or one culture, but but largely, you know, we pictured her as being sort of uh, Iranian, Assyrian, uh, sort of desert themes and stuff like that. And I just, I just, she she was the one who, from concept through to design through to the final model, I think I'm I'm really happy how how it turned out. It's exactly how we wanted it to sort of look, um, and I think it's maybe one of the more challenging ones from a from that point of view like it's not as easy to go oh well, that's a wood elf you know or, or whatever so okay yeah that. so so like talk to me about that so like um you know you guys do painting tutorials this is your this is your shtick that's your bag yeah like you want yeah. to teach people to improve their painting um you're passionate and you care about that so how does that then translate into we want to make models or we want to like present models like so, how does that work across well so when me and andy first started the the company like three or four years ago now like it was to continue doing painting classes and make them better make them more professional make them more accessible all the rest of it but from get-go we wanted to produce miniatures um and we did that sci-fi range which was great fun really enjoyed it um but we sort of dripped it out which wasn't as fun 
uh, and then we always knew we wanted to do a fantasy range um so it just was fell at this this point in the plan as it were um but there's a lot of it's just because we're massive nerds really and want to make make cool models um andy's a huge elf fan um and i like all things fantasy really mm -hmm. um so elves is what it was and then just sort of we're like well if we're going to do them they're not just going to be what other people are doing um and they can't just be different for different sake so that was the sort of challenge and then just ended up really enjoying it and now since then the setting's now getting fleshed out and we're looking at the next two uh waves of it where we explore some other fancy races as well and all of that so it's just it's just creativity i guess like we never wanted cult of paint to be just classes okay. um that's what we started as and that's what we're really good at um but we wanted to have lots of little uh other parts to the business so you've got the the airbrush you've got some things coming next year um you've got the patreon the youtube all that all that sort of stuff so it's uh it's just fun really yeah, yeah, no, I no, I get that, I, I, and I can no, and I can also I can also mirror that. Uh, there's a load of questions in the chat, so I want to make sure I ask them. I don't want to I don't want to skip them. Uh, I'll ask my questions after. Can we just all shout out number one? Darkling covers in the chat. That's Steve Dooley. Steve Dooley's been away uh, on a boat offshore, so hasn't been able to be in the chat for a while. He's back now. He's been defending the shores of England from the French, which is what we've needed because uh, yeah, those, those rat bastards. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I've decided to pick on the French. It was the Finnish earlier in the stream streak. Now it's the French. Um, uh, it's nice to see you. Uh, and there's been a couple of questions. One from uh, Art War 40k down under. A question for Henry. Favorite single paint, not range paint, e.g. scale color, DK. Uh, scale 75 decayed metal, probably. Is, is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. Uh, or, uh, wh or model, model color black. I, I There's very few models I paint where I don't use those two paints. Okay. All right. Is there a purpose for that, or? Uh, yeah, they they <laughs> they're the best versions of those colours. By like I like I won't spin the camera around, but six six or seven paint brands at least, sort of on the on the paint rack. And Vallejo model colour black is, in my opinion, the best black paint with a hairy brush there is for now. Um, and scale seventy five decayed metal is. It's basically metallic brown. So if you paint a lot of uh, coppers and golds and bronzes and colours like that, it's a great like base coat to get to go over. Um, and the scale seventy five metallics have a really nice fine flake in them, so they don't look quite so glittery like some some metallic paints can look. If you know what I mean, like they can look a bit a bit disco sometimes. Um, so yeah, those two uh, or Tamiya flat white if you talk about airbrushes. Ooh, okay. All right. So there's a. I think there's a hot question in there. Uh, Chuka Putty, also big love to you in the chat, uh, and also everyone else. Like for now, what does that mean? What's is, is there? Is there a secret? Oh, there's there? always great. There's always great paints coming out, aren't there? Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. We'll leave that. We'll leave that one hanging for today. That seems like a good one. Uh, another question that was asked in the chat is: Do you have a favorite video that you've made so far? Because obviously, one of the uh, you've made videos in the past, but obviously with lockdown and and, and teaching, like yeah. it's been a bit of a journey for you. Like, how have you I how have you found we, that I journey? Don't think we ever did. I don't think we ever did do videos in the past. I think it started in March or whatever it was this year. Um, oh, wow! And because the Kickstarter went well, we've just invested in a ton of new equipment to make the videos better, basically. Um, That's so looking forward to that. Um, what's the favourite video we've done so far? Um. I don't know. It's a really good question. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. Like, I I did a really rambling Dark Angels one for the Patreon that I just really enjoyed doing because there was no editing and nothing like that. I just sat and basically painted and talked about how I was going to approach painting this new army project. And I used this Dreadnought as a sort of test bed to do all of the colours and things I wanted to try out on. Um, and that was a nice, yeah. But that was the best video because there wasn't any editing to do, really. A little, a little bit, a little bit <laughs> always, of tweaking. Always <laughs> nice. And so I can't yeah. do offline. So I can't do offline videos because I cannot edit myself. Loathe myself. As soon as I watch it, I'm like, <laughs> fuck this. Close it. Well, throw it we in a try, bin. yeah. With the with the YouTube, we because the YouTube's it's never meant to replace classes, right? The stuff we stick on YouTube is generally going to be recipes 
because that's what people are always asking for or like core techniques um so what what washing dry brushing things like that or, or core um materials like how do i use a varnish how do i use a an oil paint those sorts of things so the videos are always quite succinct um which means you've got to be really ruthless with the editing on them which i like mm -hmm. um but it, it can be really challenging but i also i always want the audio to be really good so i re always record audio separately and that's the one that takes the time like get, getting like it's quite funny narrating what you're doing if that makes sense <laughs> Like, it I was, I was quite shocked. And especially when I know if I fuck something up, like I'll be quite, I'll be like, oh, he's about to, he's about to, oh, he's fucked it. There we go. Look at the state of that. Um, <laughs> and we're trying actually to leave in quite a few uh, times when we mess things up just to sort of show how we fix it. Yeah. Um, but I think that's, I think that's, I think that's good and honest and real, like for, for people to, to like to experience that those people aren't like I, I was watching I, I've been trying to get into um, doing some more realistic painting so I've been watching some of your videos uh, and I've been like starting to slowly research some stuff and mm. I'm just constantly like oh, I'm never gonna do that and I get it I get it you can and I'm working towards it I do I just you know um, it's one of those things where uh, you do it, it's nice it, the humanization I think is really important in some mm, in some cases so just so you can be like oh okay yeah they fuck up too like yeah. even after all this time that's good 100 percent. that's what i always used to love like when i go on classes and i still do and I, i'm looking forward to going on classes again but i always loved seeing how the how that person i went to see like what how are they messed that up what they're going to do to fix it is it going to derail them you know is it a big issue is it a small issue and sort of understanding how to identify that you know, is, is it something I need to be really upset about? Nah, don't worry about it. Be fine. I'll get it later. Or, yes, don't struggle on. Don't try and fudge this. You fucked it. You need to now unfuck it, basically. Mm. Um, and I think that to me is far more valuable than you put the red here and the lighter red here and, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Uh, can I say uh, thanks to uh, Dave Fraser being here? Cold shoulder. Morning, Ben Boyd. Hello, uh, Dave. Dog. Uh, hello. This is uh, you will have seen uh, Henry on Vince Ventrella's show. Uh, oh, that absolutely. was great fun. That was yeah, really yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's a good guy, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Just a better version of me, generally. Uh, <laughs> like that's that's pretty much how we that's pretty much how we pitch it nowadays, uh, and that's fine with me. Uh, <laughs> that's probably fair. <laughs> probably fair <laughs> cheers mate uh, appreciate sure. that. <laughs> uh, yeah you can still ask questions feel free to ask any questions you want um okay so have you the the video process you've enjoyed it though right no not really oh if, if i'm abs if i'm absolutely honest no but i really love what we do and i whether it's arrogance or not i i genuinely think we can bring something to the party with it all and i'm don't want to put my name on something and do something if it looks a bit shit so okay. we just do the work to make them look good but no it's it's really not i don't and i know andy doesn't really enjoy it either in the sense of the, the the process itself is not enjoyable because you are painting in a an unusual way whereas like on a class we mm -hmm. don't we don't tend to use cameras and screens and things on classes, partly because we always try and have small numbers in classes rather than like 20, 30 people, um, because I think it's important that you can see what the artist or the tutor or whatever is doing, like with their hands, how they're holding the model, what's to the sides, why have they put their palette there? Why have they? Oh, that's a good idea. Maybe I'll use that sort of water pot All the, all those things that you're paying the money, in my opinion, to go and, and learn, not yes. just have color in. Um, so. Whenever we were doing a demonstration at a class, the only real fake or the, the only the only um, factor that isn't exactly how we would be painting at home is perhaps we're having to do it a little quicker that, 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 than we might do at home or not. Right. Maybe not quite as relaxed as we would be at home. So, you know, you, but you're painting normally, you know, you're in an uncomfy chair usually, but you're painting as normal. You pass it around, you show people, you talk about it, whereas painting on camera it's, it's even if you've got the best rig and all the rest of it itself, it's never quite the same. 
um, because inevitably that that eye dot or whatever that you you normally do at home, you end up with the camera just getting a big view of the top of your head as you sort of lean in to to do the little dot or things like that. So, no, as a process, I don't find it enjoyable whatsoever. I really like the end product, though. Yeah, it's, it's it's the same for me. It really is like like uh, like and i think that i think one of the things that i feel like an affinity with you for obviously apart from our fucking absolutely 10 out of 10 faces is um <laughs> uh, <laughs> is is that like the live nature I, this was something i've been struggling with just even the past few weeks and i think i've mentioned it on the show as well like i'm so excited so last night this, <laughs> this is gonna sound bold but last night i was writing tournament event packs which is hilarious, as I literally cannot legally see another human being right now. Mm. Like, so, like, that might seem a bit far flung, but as soon as we can run events here, or I can go to events, like, that's going to be where I'm at. And, like, yeah. the the nature, like, I've really loved doing the shows with Owen, let's say, on a Monday, where we've been, like, deep diving this. Like, me and Nick, Tom, have been doing, like, really good work, I think, in analysing stuff for 40k, and I've really enjoyed all that stuff, but it's just not who I am. I can't, like, sit in a room with a camera yeah. in front of me for, yeah. like... It's just, it's just not my vibe. Like yeah. this, these shows, love these shows. These are the ones. Like these are great. Talking to you is great. Like and and the Twitch chat are incredible. And, and even when I just talk on my own, it's cool. But like once I can get back out there in the field, I am just all about that. And like and I'm just gearing up towards that really, um, because it's just, it's just the fun. Like and it's the passion. It's the people. Yeah. They create the energy. And I think it's, well, it's just what a- made you quit whatever jobs you've done previously to go full time, right? It's, yes. It's, it's I. It's the. It's a. As silly as it sounds, it's much more about the community than it is about painting miniatures. You know, that's that's where the joy comes from. What what I do as a job, and I'm sure from you, like yeah. you, you 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 are you want to? I, I don't know where you feel, but I you I want to add to a community. So the Warhammer community, the gaming community in general, has given me tons over the years. I feel I'm in a place with a certain set of skills to not sounding worthy and all that nonsense, but to give back to that community or or just improve that community, right? Because if that community is better in general, I'll have more fun, you know? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like you said, you also see things inside your community that you, like that could be improved. And then you're like, you're looking around and you think, okay, no one else is doing this. It's like when I set up my only jams, there's no one really doing like detailed jam reviews. Um, tell I, me, I, right, tell, so I got, I got to check with this. So okay, I, I've barely been on social media or anything really in a non-work capacity now for about 10 weeks because with the kickstarter and the, the build-up and then the thing like i've hardly seen any of the shows it's just been rammed right yeah but i pop on twitter occasionally and i saw this jam thing and one of the best episodes of peep show which is obviously one of the best shows ever created <laughs> agreed <laughs> yeah. is all about uh well not all about has an incredible scene in it involving jam and me and one of my best mates will often text each other quotes from that episode. And I think you were talking to to DJ. Uh, I can't think what DJ's tag is in, in Twitch, but DJ anyway, on yeah. Twitter. And I was like, oh, 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 jam, I'll just stick in one of these, these random peep show quotes, which I believe was uh, lick mummy's finger. <laughs> um, and, and, then, and then there was nothing for a while. And I was like, have I... Was this a mistake? Like, have I, have I, have I assumed I'm too comfortable in this situation? And then, and then it was the the Diana Memorial Strawberry and things like that. And I was like, oh God, have I gone? Have I gone too far there? Was this too, you know, too this, that, and the other? But eventually, it got a like. I was like, oh, at least one person gets it. I'm not just being <laughs> this really pervy weird dude. Peep Show hasn't like, Peep Show hasn't gone outside the UK particularly much. I realised because like Val and Pete, who yeah. I think have like a, a very similar sense of humour to all of us, I was like, "You guys should watch this," and they were like, "Ah," and I'm like, "It's very I, funny." I think I, I I get it though. I think it's because it, I didn't like it when I first watched it. When it first came out, wasn't into it, and then for some reason, I can't honestly can't think why, but I binged it, um, and within like three or four episodes, I was like, "Oh my god, this is like actual genius." Um, but it's, it's, it's proper suburban. It's not suburban, but it, it's, it's colloquial might be the right term. I don't know. It's, I think it's only funny to British people because it's little nuances that only British people get. Like when people think of Brits, they don't think necessarily of 
the stuff that's in Peep Show because it's pretty boring, mundane stuff, isn't it? Like just yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. Whereas for them, you know, Black Adder or Monty Python or or Fingy things like tiles. that is more yeah. stereo. Yeah, oh, that's stereotypical Brits, right? Yeah, um, it's, but, there's, for, there's but, a... but Peep Show is more stereotypical Brits. Like yeah, it, yeah, it definitely is. Like it's a hundred percent is. But there's a there's a great uh, there's a cartoon I really enjoy on Netflix called uh, F is for Family. Oh yeah, brilliant. And again, it's, it's Bill Burr, um, American comedian. But it, I think it's one of those ones where if I didn't have American friends who talked to me about it, I wouldn't get half the jokes that are in it yeah. because they're just those lovely little observations on just mundane, everyday bullshit that happens in that country. Yeah, it just like like anyway. like, the, like the Office and therefore the American Office translates quite yeah. well because it's yeah because because that works really well. Like there's some others like I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of Phoenix Knights. Huge fan. If you've ever seen one Phoenix of, Knights, one of one of the best. <laughs> one of <laughs> the best. Yeah, that Good that was me. that came to us when we had that horrible vacuum of like you, you had obviously you had all the guys in the eighties and nineties like the the Black Adder crew and they did all those great spin offs and things like that. And then we had maybe we had Vic and Bob, right? So shooting stars and stuff. In the nineties coming through. Yeah. It's like where are the far show? But then it was it was post far show, wasn't it? It's was like where where's the next thing coming from? Where's the next great comedy uh, ensemble thing coming from? And it was Phoenix Nights, wasn't it? Um, and if you guys haven't seen Phoenix Nights, Phoenix Nights, and also a particularly special place in my heart, having worked in nightclubs for over a decade, uh, because they are. Because Phoenix Nights is about uh, a working man's club, which is kind of like what um, in the uh, north, class... north of England. Yeah, yeah, which working class folk go to, um, where still to this day you can buy pork scratchings, like in a like carrier bag, uh, like uh, brilliant places. And then um, it's just about the people in it, and it reminded me so much of my childhood. But then also later on working as like a, a in nightclubs, it was the funniest situation because <laughs> it was exactly like that all the time. Yeah. Like <laughs> uh, yeah. anyway. Anyway, it's brilliant. A... But Peter Kay's a genius. Did you you seen the ones he did beforehand as well? The like one offs where he was like a um, a Mister Whippy driver. And, yeah, uh, was the manager of the M- motorway service station and stuff. Also, my uh, the photographer. So the girl that was my like photographer for like four or five years, actually, uh, Charlotte Ando, wonderful, wonderful woman. She um, she was direct. She was from Chorley and uh, Chorley <laughs> FM uh, was Coming what he would talk ears. about. And her dad was a hairdresser, and he cut Peter Kay's hair. Yeah, nice. so I had this like direct line, which always made me laugh, and I was like, "Chorley FM ish." Here we go. Anyway, that's uh... sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, that's it's, fine. That's uh, the... very tangential. Yeah, that was very tangential. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes, yeah, so I mentioned nightclubs. Whatever. I'm so sorry. Um, right, okay. Let's get back on. Let's get back on track. Are we back on track? So, future projects. We're not allowed to talk about the future projects at the minute, right? Uh, talk, talk about over you, won't I think I just reached out to you, and I was like, I've had like eight weeks of just utter like blitzing it with the kickstarter and stuff and um hobby and everything's just dropped off a cliff and i just needed to get enthusiastic again and lockdown affects that and i know certainly for me during the first lockdown um i really looked forward to listening to the show each day you know it was that sort of hour you know and and, and it was again it was it was the bit of a community that i really enjoyed um, it didn't matter that I wasn't painting or I wasn't gaming or whatever. Actually, the community was still there and uh, and all of that. So I think I just sort of hit you up as like, look, do you want to just natter about hobby, really? And the answer is yes. Like, all yes. day. Like, <laughs> I, 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 I need to thank you. And I know you said off air you didn't remember saying this, but you did. The best piece of the best piece of painting advice I've ever had in my whole life, ever, has got very little to do with actual painting. Although I did buy one of them brushes you suggested. Yeah, well, we'll come on to that shortly. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> But however, I'm changing my mind a little bit. I don't know. Like, um, I've gone through. I've gone through all sorts. Your basically the chat with you inspired me. So I've done all sorts. I've bought some different dry brushes. Uh, I've got a wet palette now, like a grown up. Um, uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> but the best piece of advice I got was only have one project in front of you on the table, finish it, move on to the next project, and honestly changed my life like i don't feel stressed anymore i like there's loads of stuff around me i just blitz through one thing and i get it done and it's also really good for like helping you prioritize you're like instead of like i've got to do this whole army you just Mm -hmm. go all right cool i'm gonna do this one thing and you do it and you're like sweet and it's like in and then 
since I know obviously lockdown as well, so like there's been lots of opportunity to paint. Um, but I've just been blasting through armies and units because I've just done one un- one thing at a time, whatever mm-hmm. that one thing might mm-hmm. be. Um, so thank you for that. That was brilliant advice. Yeah, but like I say, tons of people do it. You know, it's 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 something that I don't know who I would have picked it up off, but certainly chatting to someone at a class or something like that, then or whatever mentioning it but it does you're right it does help it's like you lay there at night thinking about the next day or whatever you don't need what am i going to do to relax in my hobby to be a stress you know um in at the, at the when you lay lay awake at night do you, you know you sort of sit down and say oh, okay yeah i'll do that now then um like i'm doing a, a few commissions at the moment and that was hard to get into sort of motivated doing them because i haven't done commissions for a little while um but this morning it was like oh come on just start with the squad let's let's go and 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 you know before i knew it it was time to to come on here and stuff so that's what i was doing a minute ago masking some things up okay uh, yeah it's yes, um I, it honestly this, like this is great advice. you like to do masking what is it masking putty what do you it's use called, it for so it's it's like it's it's like blue tack but it's not it's cleverer um, okay. It's like silly putty, but it's better. Um, so it's uh, a masking thing. So, so if you want to sp- spray over something and you don't want it to go over what's underneath. Um, so, for instance, on these Marines, I've painted the shoulder pad. And I just put that over them and then I can. So if it's an irregular surface, so let's, you know, well, you can't use tape. But no, I just, it's really good. Oh, really? That's interesting. I, I think I used that once. I used it for. Are you? But I use the stuff that you get in, um, like the kids' putty. Yeah, silly putty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it just and the same thing? But like, I know, that's all this is, right? They've yeah, just probably. stuck it in a tin and charged me four times as much for it. <laughs> but I really like it, so you know. If you trust a product as well, it's hard to move away from. Right, you were going to say something to me about brushes. So you? Oh no, you. So right, yeah. Come yeah. on. Yeah. What's this? Because in the well, the few times gonna I make you laugh. Mentioned, I lost it. Yet. I lost it yesterday. I, I've been looking for it for literally minutes, and um, uh, I can't find it. Uh, but no, I was just—it was just a bit um, big, I think, at the start. So what, it, it did felt you, like, what did you buy in the end? I bought a Windsor and Newton, yeah, Series Seven, yeah, brush watercolor, yeah, that was the size that you meant to buy. Well, that's actually quite hard to find. Yeah, it's so, one of one of the reasons I really like Artis Opus as a brand is because the the quality of them's same as Windsor and Newton's but they're in a lot of hobby shops oh it's open so, stuff yeah so you can go into a hobby shop and get a good quality rush whereas with your Windsors you're tending to have to go to art stores and that type of thing which which is it's just a barrier isn't it yeah um, it is but I did pick up I did pick up a, a Windsor and New- no sorry an Otis brush series d for dry brushing brilliant yeah is Love that right is, i've done right <laughs> well, well. high five me uh, <laughs> let's go and i tried that and that did work really well so i'm just trying to be like yeah, I, I guess the thing for me is um is taking it a bit more seriously as, since i last spoke to you has been like a progression for me just just trying a bit harder uh if nothing else it just make sure you keep your brushes clean and then make sure yeah. that you're just like spending an, like half a minute more. And you do it; it does generally work quicker and is a bit nicer. That's, that's yeah. been my it's, it, it, to me. It just makes the, the jobs easier. And like, I think you were saying, oh, I'm not used to painting with such a large brush. And it, it's not me trying to be like Billy Big Bollocks going, oh yeah, I paint eye lenses with a size three brush or whatever because it's got a point on. That's not true. When I've got to paint that, I go down, right down to a size zero or double zero or whatever. Mm-hmm. But the advantage with these with these bigger brushes i've just cleaned all mine i've got my oil brushes in front of me here we are the advantage of these bigger ones um is that you can hold more paint in in them right so you can paint for longer so you can paint for longer without having to go back to the palette all the time okay which is a big advantage right but but also if you you don't have to fill them right so if if you're if you feel the brush is a bit big for the area that you're working on and you haven't got another one, well, you can just not put that much paint on the brush and treat it like a smaller brush, if that makes sense. Like, you're obviously going to get the flexing at a different point, blah, blah, blah. But it's, uh, yeah, I think we, we see a lot of people on classes will 
just load their brush up and then regardless of the consistency of the paint that they're using they'll just load the brush up and that and you, even if it's a good brush that's not, nothing's going to happen if you do that you know really you want your brush looking a bit like a felt tip pen so you yeah. can sort of see, see the bristles still right um, not like a blob of paint, but equally if, if you're doing washes or, or glazing is a really common one. So a glaze is just a really, really translucent paint, which often you'll create by taking something like a wash or an ink or a, or a heavily pigmented color. So a strong color, you, you'll water it down loads and then you will apply extremely thin layers of that over the model and it will just tint or filter or just ever so slightly change the color that's on the model right mm -hmm. um or and you might use that for that purpose so you use it all over in which case an airbrush is really handy for doing that sort of thing with or it might be to help you do a little blend right so when you see those really nice power weapons that you get those transitions from like dark blue to light blue to white and back again yeah that's where you'd use glazes you'd use tiny little glazes in between to to, to smooth it out but that paints really dilute so as soon as it, your brush touches another surface capillary action is going to suck that liquid off the brush onto the surface right? okay so if you've got a lot on there you're going to put it on the model and it's going to go blah, blah, all over it and you're going to go oh fuck and you're going to have tide marks and you have all this horrible stuff and it won't dry properly and all the rest of it so if you're going to be glazing with it you would load your brush in your palette like you normally would but then you really need to touch off a lot of that excess so i do that on my jeans but you know you might have a piece of kitchen paper i do or, it on my jeans too <laughs> or li yeah limp i i only have painting clothes now so it doesn't matter <laughs> i think <laughs> i think mine, from, co I think, I think mine comes thing. from only having dog clothes at one <laughs> yeah, point where it was just yeah, slobber uh, i was yeah. like I, this is a surface now this is not clothes <laughs> and she she loves it like she's like oh what's this new chemical you've got any trousers there let's have a let's have a try on that kind of thing um as if i needed anything more to worry about with her um but yeah that's it's just saying like um just because it's a bigger brush doesn't mean you always have to load it right up and and do all of that with it. Uh, there's can. a question. A question. You were talking then about uh, a strong a strong color. What does yeah. what does like what does that mean? Um. So. Uh, strong strong. I shouldn't have used the word strong. A heavily pigmented color, right? Okay. So, some some paints you'll notice when you thin them down, they'll get to a point where they it, they split basically and you can see the pigment floating around okay. and it's separate to the other stuff so that paint probably isn't going to work very well for a glaze right because you you can't thin it thin enough and it maintains its um integrity um so as, a, as an example like uh, we, we could take like a a, a red ink and a, and a red paint and because they're made in different ways you're always going to be able to get a stronger color from an ink at a thinner consistency than you are from taking a normal red paint and thinning it right down. And that's simply okay. because of how the pigment is dispersed and, uh, and created. But that's very boring and nerdy. No, I don't think it is. I think it's really interesting. <laughs> I got, a, I got a, also a point. I got a point to make about what you were saying about loading a brush up because mm. it's only just kind of connected with a thought in my head. Because when I first started painting, obviously you do your classic, you get your Games Workshop paints you start painting and you buy their brushes and like yes there are painting tutorials but you know like you don't really like you don't necessarily you're like oh, cool i'm gonna put blue on and you're like okay you know off you go um and i guess one of the things that for me i found the pots deeply frustrating the yeah. concept of having to open the pot like every time my head whether or not it was like a laziness thing or whatever it was i remember i would just be like you know sometimes i pin it open or like you know sometimes the paint would pull in the top part um you know that, that bit and you would kind of get it out of there and once that was there you'd have to close it shake it again open it again maybe you'd spray paint everywhere like yeah. and this and the difference having recently like got a wet palette if or, or if nothing else just drop a uh paints in the surface so the ease is like outrageous and i feel like a, it's much easier to go get some more paint whereas yeah. i do feel like the games workshop pots it's harder to go get more paint and so i just instinctively put too much paint on my brush i don't know if you've uh, okay thought, i see what does, you mean does that make sense i'm kind yeah, of like yeah, yeah. oh i want to get a load of paint out here the nice thing now is with you using the wet palette 
that shouldn't be a concern anymore. So I, I use a lot of GW paints. I really like the vast majority of them, but I completely agree with you. I, I really dislike the pots. And this is something we've fed back to them um, where we've been in a position to be able to feed back and stuff. But they really like their pots. So it is what it is. But because we don't paint from the pot, that's not really an issue um, in the sense of you take a scoop out with a crappy old brush, not your nice Windsor & Newton, Take a scoop out with that, pop it on your wet palette, and that's good for ages. Then you can come back to that another session; it will probably still, still be there, and and you're good to go. And it means that you're not discounting that enormous range of of paints, um, yes, which, which they have. And as I said, they have some great ones. Um, yeah, I'm not. No, I'm, it's, this is yeah. not a bash. It's not a bash. It's just you, you said that, and I was like, yeah, I'd always put loads of brush on my paint. And I was like, why? And it was like it was because it was just fucking annoying. No, I, <laughs> like, I think that, that, yeah, that makes sense. And I think I probably still do that sometimes. And you're like, oh well, I'll wipe the excess off on the model, like you know, as I'm painting, <laughs> kind of thing. But that's not. Yeah, no, I think that this will be the heavy <laughs> bit, and then I'll just quickly get it off. Yeah, exactly yeah. the same. <laughs> oh my god oh good idea yeah it just takes um it takes a while anyway yeah yeah it's super interesting so one of the questions i had this is a this is a me question um is obviously with the bunch of models that you release in mm. like have you have you any thoughts about like their inclusion in a game uh, uh, or anything like that yeah a, li a little bit um a little bit i think okay. we've we've had a couple of people reach out and there's some conversations to have uh, around okay. that one one thing that was interesting was we had a a few like D D players uh get contact us during it going like oh are you are you gonna bring them out as 28 mil or 32 mil whatever and we were like well no because they won't work at that scale because of the detail right. um, and the manner of the detail they just they just won't work the best way to think of it is um think about how feathers or fur look on your on your tabletop miniatures and then look at them on a larger scale model. So a 54 mil, which ours are, or, or a 75 mil, it, it, it's, it's really different. Um, and both have their benefits and, and strengths. But one thing we are now going to do for the next Kickstarter is, is seriously look at whether we can do something with them at a smaller scale. Okay. Um, so people can use them for D and D. Um, there's, I, I think that would be the only way we ever went would be an RPG esque system. Yeah. Um, there's certainly no desire to to create yet another Warhammer clone. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I think there's plenty of them out there. Yeah, I no, I, I, I could see that. I, I also think that there's there's uh, and I talked about this on the show previously. Um, I think that there's a significant opportunity right now. Uh, for a whole bunch of model designers and also for hobbyists never has there been such an option of models available to everyone yeah, and i think yeah and, and i think like obviously ignoring covid like as much as you would like to like wh whenever like tournaments open up again and life becomes whatever the the version after covid will be i imagine there'll be tournaments and that's one of the things i'm excited about like about running independent events specifically like non-games workshop really because it means you can use a whole variety of models like the guys yeah. that I play a lot of Gaslands yeah um, yeah. yeah so yeah. they play a load of Gaslands and they're just using fucking any old car they're like I printed this I printed Night Rider I'm going to use this in Gaslands yeah, and you're yeah, like yeah. okay that's cool like, I did, and I think I did my van I got a I got a matchbox version of my camper van oh perfect and weathered up for, for that <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so and I think that's I think that is the truly exciting element. I think I think creating miniatures just to create miniatures, I think, is genuinely a really valuable thing. Like the process of like, yeah, yeah, yeah it's fun, and also yeah. like for consumers and for generally the community, be miniatures community. There's so much accessibility, which is really really exciting, yeah. especially for me as a, a gamer and also like to is what I really want is to see that creativity displayed. Like, I think like. Someone's like, oh, yeah, I went and sport, spent thirteen pound on like like thirty metal, thirteen pound per one on each metal acolyte for Scryer yeah. for Skaven. I'm like, no, don't do I that. I got in on that just at yeah. the right time. I had a <laughs> fucking box of them, and I was like, I ain't never painting these, right? <laughs> or do eBay with you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whereas, uh, whereas, like, um, you know, uh, like. Punji do some stuff some other people do some other yeah, stuff yeah i mean Mer mercia miniatures was was always the one wasn't it for for a lot of 
um, alternative whammer figures. Yeah. Um, like I, I mean, I've I've got boxes of the stuff because I because Mercia's aesthetic, and funnily enough, it's because of some of the sculptors they've had working for them. Um, and then, did you ever come across uh, Adrian Smith's Hate game? Mm, I might. Yes, I might. I've seen some bits. So of it, it was. Yeah. It was a. He was. He was. Was and I believe still does the odd thing, but was a big artist for GW for many many years. Mm. Um, and his stuff was particularly prevalent when when Warhammer Fantasy went more grim dark. Um, he then did his own graphic novel, but it was very very similar to a, a graphic novel about Chaos Marauders, basically. Okay, it was his take on barbarians and that type of thing. Really really cool. And then Cool Mini or Not picked it up and said, "Look, we want to make a Kickstarter exclusive because it's Cool Mini or Not um, <laughs> game about yeah. it." Um, and they brought in phenomenal sculptors again some sculptors who perhaps have worked for mercia um forge world those types of things in the past and they made all these miniatures for it and i was like oh my god this is this is adrian smith was my like idol my inspiration for so much stuff i've done in the hobby was his yeah. aesthetic um, people talk about john blanche and he's amazing i think he's amazing don't get me wrong but for me carl kapinski adrian smith it, it was um oh, i can't think of the other dude's name now Paul Dainton, I think it was. Um, their artworks, what got me back into the hobby, really. Um, that sort of grim, dark vibe that they've got going. Um, but yeah, so I've got boxes of their miniatures to one day make my dream sort of hordes of chaos army from. Yes. But one thing I found with that is I'm now much more inclined to paint those up and base them up to play Old World Warhammer with. Because it's that aesthetic in my head. I do feel like AOS is going, and I like the fact it is, it's really beginning to get an aesthetic to it now. Yep. And also given the fact that they're all in, or 99.9% of them are all plastic, plastic and resin never look the same. Never. Even when it's CAD, it never ends up looking the same. And yep. I think the way that GW have chosen to go with sculpting, I, I find it really hard now mixing the older stuff with the new stuff. Um, and not just because the scale is wildly different nowadays um, on the models, but like, you know, I, I've got all these projects of like old, old Warhammer models that I adored and I saved until I was good enough to paint them. Um, and I'm pulling them out of boxes now. I'm just like, mm, that's not going to work next to that Primaris Marine. That's not going to work next to that Stormcast model, whatever, because it just looks like a different game. Um, so that's tough, man. So I think if I was going to do an alternate miniature like project you you really if you want it to look really good i think you've got to be on it so for instance i know andy's really keen to use the woodsman model we did he wants to use him as an orion counts as yeah in his sylvaneth army um which is great you know it'll work as dry or something like that i don't know it's about the right size for that but we had a lot of people contact us going oh can you make it a bit bigger so we can use it as a as a giant as like a forest giant type model uh, and thankfully we were able to get to that stretch goal which has allowed us to to go and do that okay. um, it's an awful lot easier to biggerize something a bit than smallerize it is that science is that biggerize uh, a genuine... That's science fact <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> uh, no that's that's also i think that's also one of the really exciting elements about about stuff produced by other companies as well like and with the technology of stls and stuff games workshop you're only ever going to get a marine the size of marine like mm. if you wanted for some reason for some reason a giant marine you could end up with like a giant i know obviously there's some companies that are making some of toys and stuff but what i mean is, is you can scale stuff up yeah. like it, in the right context if it's possible if the technology is available and things and i think that's genuinely very very exciting and i think it's also yeah. for me it's exciting because you look at some stuff like i think about guardsmen at the minute and they've just got really old oh. terrible sculpts yeah like absolutely and the amount of like humans with a gun in space is yeah. there's tons there's tons yeah, on yeah, the internet yeah. and also you can you can you can make awesome stuff and, oh, and isn't that the, isn't that the point of the hobby making awesome stuff not being yeah. locked into what you have to buy like yeah. a good example obviously recently was all the seraphon with the salamanders like don't yeah. buy the ones from games workshop like yeah. ever <laughs> yeah there's, there's tons of really great like lizards isn't there like alternative like stls or 
uh, or Mercia again or companies doing the actual models. Yeah, there's there's tons. I think what I was maybe what I was saying there is I love alternative miniatures. I just I almost feel like they have to be alternative armies as opposed okay. to just one miniature dropped in a lot of the time. Yeah, no, like, I, I, hate, uh, I yeah. like the aesthetic to work across the army. Um, and I, I would find it a bit jarring if I dropped in a a certain older style sculpt into a very modern style sculpt army. But yeah, Imperial Guard, Chaos, Alternate Lizard Men, things like that. If it's the whole army, yeah, wicked. Like, it's yeah. awesome. That makes yeah. me think of one of, my, one of my favorite sculpts ever is The Harbinger of Decay by Jez Goodwin. Uh, the guy yes. on the horse. Yeah. Uh, yeah, with yeah, the yeah. little sign and the crow, love that. But it's like I was saying this the other day on the show. It's very, very different to the. Just looks the, odd, right? You stick it does. Next, like Blight Kings and and all of that. And and I'm not saying you shouldn't have a. I I love what they've done with Nurgle. I love how it's he's developed as this uh, god and his followers have got. I, I honestly think it was the best thing in early AOS was what they did with Nurgle, um, and one of the stories. I can't remember which one of the early novels or, or short stories spoke about all these different great unclean ones attacking somewhere. Um, and it described them all. And they weren't all these just big, jolly, fat blobs. You know, they talked about this really creepy, super skeletal, you know, wasted, lanky one. Nice. You know, and, and, yeah. and you know, these other ones, like the, you know, much more scaled and things. And I was just like, that's really cool. Like, and to the point where I went and maybe I will finish that. Maybe that will come on the table soon. But I wanted to use Mortarian to create a different take on a great unclean one and, and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, Nurgles. I don't even know why we're on to that now. Oh, yeah. No, no. Harbinger of Decay. Yeah. I think yeah. you can have a, a skeletal Nurgle model, but it, it, it needs to be made from the newer stuff, in my opinion. Be, be, because the aesthetics change now and the proportions have changed it, it, it's and the the scale it, it just doesn't work it looks like you've taken a historical model and plonked it in your warhammer army you yeah might. that makes sense yeah no yeah yeah i hear what you're saying yeah yeah it's a good point it's a really good point i guess that also matches up with um with like paint schemes as well because that's one of that's one of my biggest um uh, problems is so like I like Warhammer Fantasy Battle Eighth Edition. I had like a Seraphon army, which I tried super hard to paint. I like I really enjoyed it. It was like super nice. I was really into it. And now I want to add additional elements to it, mm. um, uh, like uh, rebase it, like because I want to like I want to basically re re because like that bless them. They've had such a tough life. They were all, like some really nice square bases, and then they got like. They got, like yeah, they, they they got smashed into um uh some horrible rounds like just quickly for a tournament because it was like brand new age of Sigma and then it was like and then like there's some other order stuff and it's all just thrown together and now I'm like okay I'm gonna rebase all my order stuff into mm. one basing scheme and get it all yeah. together but then I want to go re redo and repaint some other units and now I'm like I don't it's remember tough. how I painted that or what to do that's tough yeah. what's the what, obviously in, apart from travel at 88 miles an hour and um go back in time have you got a suggestion for... uh, stuff and like, i mean i i try my hardest to record all the painting i do as in write down the colors i've used so okay. i can go back to to books if i have to go back and, and that was born more from the commission thing so if someone came back to me and they'd had an army off me six months ago and they wanted to add one unit i was like fuck fuck right how did i do that it's all written down now obviously i i <laughs> Go out and just make a YouTube channel and just film everything you do. <laughs> you forget about it. You can just press the video and you can watch watch how you did it, and it's great. Perfect. Uh, but it, it's tough, man. Like going back to armies. Like I I I often bemoan the fact I've never been like a hundred percent all in on one thing. Like I've only ever wanted to paint ultramarines, or I've only ever wanted to paint orcs. Where I've never been that. I enjoy nearly all of it. I think going, but the benefit it means is that I don't end up with this rambling collection that is not cohesive. And again, for me, the hobbies always starts with how it looks. So when I'm picking an army, I will give as much consideration to a variety of sizes of models, how it's going to look together on the shelf, how it's going to look displayed on a board, as I will to write that unit's a crock of shit, don't bother with that, do this, that, that type mm -hmm. of thing. But when it comes to going back to armies and trying to to bring them up to your modern stuff, I think the two things, and it's easier in in uh, sci-fi stuff, I think, because you've got 
less organic stuff you tend to have a lot of metal and things like that the two ways i think you can do it easily are basing as you said cohesive basing across the arm is going to help tons mm -hmm. um but also things like weathering or battle damage um you know if you've recently started using oil paints to do a little bit of pin washing or weathering go back to your old models and do that over them they will instantly look a hell of a lot closer to your and it's perfectly safe to go and do that the oil's not going to go and damage your paintwork or, or anything like that you don't need to varnish them and just go and go and go and do it so that would probably be my way to tie in old models okay uh, but brutally honest i just put them on ebay and start again <laughs> oh no way that's what i do like, man. Like, it's I, such a drama for me to even paint anything purpose, right like sell it start again it's like <laughs> I, I very rarely strip models anymore because it's just it's a ball lake and they're never quite as nice so just sell it and get a new one. Okay, no, that's Which, fair. Uh, the world's the world's probably only got another couple of years left in it anyway, right? So <laughs> I'm sort of over that now. <laughs> just to... That's a good point. It's a good point. I think that all the time. I'm like such big plans, but so yeah. little time. Um, <laughs> Dave Chin, who's brilliant by the way. I don't know if you've ever like uh, been in touch with Dave. He he runs. Um, He's like super lovely bloke here over in Republic of Ireland, and uh, he works really really hard when they have competitive tournaments to also run like the painting competition. Nice. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and he's like really trying super hard to like make sure not only because uh you know he works in tan in tandem kind of with Mick um and those guys and to make sure they got make sure there's lots of tournaments and competitive stuff happening and Dave really make sure the painting level like gets brought up as well, mm -hmm. which I think is a massive uh positive. He but he asked, do you ever varnish your models for gaming? Is that everything you do? Uh, not so. I, I will generally my models will get varnish on them at some point in the process, but I I don't forget. Like partly I pick things up by the base because I'm not a fucking savage, so that helps. Um, you know, you see some of your friends will just like fucking throw them in the the what's it the walls ice cream tub that they brought them in. Yeah, throw them in there and stuff. That's 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 probably not going to varnish. Probably isn't going to help you is what i'm saying with, with that yep. type of thing but the other big thing and like not to be flippant like that um a, a, the vast majority of models now are plastic and the, the paint stays on the plate it doesn't rub off the plastic half as easy as uh, as it used to rub off on like your resin and your metal models um so no and the, and the reason for that is because varnish changes the finish of a model as in um how shiny it is how matte it is um and therefore how much the shadows show so if it's glossier it's going to look darker if it's more matte the highlights will be exaggerated rather than the shadows so you've got all sorts of things that i you've chosen to play with and manipulate on the model to look a certain way if i then just blatted it with varnish at the end i may as well have not bothered you know our scale 75 brown leathers this lovely matte finished paint that makes your leather look really matte and worn so great i've used that I've deliberately used that paint because of the finish of it, not the colour. If I spray varnish over it, you're going to lose it. So, oh, I get no. that. Yeah, no. like I, it'll usually get varnish on it after the main colour's done, and then not again. Um, and as I say, I just pick it up by the rims of the bases wherever I try. I play a lot more skirmish games though, to be fair. Um, so it's it's a lot easier to pick up twelve yeah, months across a session than it is to, you know your hundred skaven slaves or whatever that you've got yeah but you've not painted them well you've not painted a hundred skaven slaves no, but well, that's like... that's and that was that was so this is another tangent but that's what put me off uh the last edition of why i'm a fantasy battles because gw produced great looking models but i had to paint 50 of them for a regiment mm -hmm. well i'm not going to pay that money whatever it is i'm going to pay that and get really good quality models probably the best in class of those models mm -hmm. i'm not not going to paint them but I'm not like what on earth like it's I have a real big problem with that um, and it's why I adore things like Epic and Warmaster and sort of that scale game for playing mass battles um, I because think because the, de yeah. the details well yeah because as... th that's that works right the details are there so you can paint them all to the same standard and it looks like a mass battle game whereas yeah you know what it got like in the last edition of Fantasy Battle like mm -hmm. 100, 100 Skaven Slaves like I, yeah like there's there's it's just that was it. it was the end for me like that 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 was a huge barrier to me and not uh, and not being like oh i can afford it but the price wasn't the issue there with needing that many models the issue was 
I don't want to do a shit paint job. Yeah, no, I get that. I, no, I, I do. And, 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 and arguably, that's kind of like where my initial paint style came from as well. I think, again, one of those learned experiences is, you know, I, I can't, one of my first armies was some Empire, and you're like, fuck, mm-hmm. I've got to blast out 120 dudes. Yeah. Uh, jokes in the chat. And, um, uh, like, <laughs> uh, like, you know, you've got to, you, that's a lot. That's a lot. It's a big, like, it's a big job. Like, yeah, yeah. and, you know, and you've got to work really hard to make sure they look really nice. Um, well, not even nice, just get them done. Like, it's a lot of effort. Whereas 40K, I, it feels, it feels like the model count is lower. In oh, I'm the new so 40K. excited about that. I'm so excited about the new edition being, um, like, just as you said, then focusing on a slightly smaller model count partly because i think it will just look better like one of the other issues was you had these i always had it in heresy like that was how i got back in the hobby was was, was heresy in 30k and stuff but you'd, you'd have a six by four table and you'd have 20 tanks on one side of it it looks like a car park like it just just didn't work for me like it, yeah. it, you know it, it, that needed to be a 12 by 12 table or whatever um to look cool hence why i liked epic or or Warmaster and stuff, but I'm really, really excited actually about the new edition of 40k being slightly more focused on going back to what it was in the early days, which was a just a sort of quite busy skirmish, right? Yes, you know, it was a snapshot of a battle. You didn't need to have all the things that you'd have in an army in your army. It was a snapshot. You were the, you were that part of the line, or you were this skirmish and stuff. Um, back where, and it means that centerpiece models become centerpiece models again. You know the 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 when when one Lehman Russ was terrifying, but it, it also, from a height point of view, was an imposing model on the table. So again, the immersion and uh, and all of that. So that's a massive like for me picking armies. As much as I would adore to do a big orc horde or a guard army, or um, desperate to do a slaves to darkness army for for AOS, but I'm just not. I'm not painting eighty. You know, marauders. Books. Yeah. Oh, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> James is feel ashamed of himself. Um, <laughs> he he but, is a monster. Like, but if it makes you any really better, they also look he awful. He keeps talking about how much job. he enjoys painting, and then, yeah. Um, like, but weirdly, the weirdly the thing I enjoyed painting the most was uh, I, I've said this before. I painted uh, Heresy from Mechanicum. There's Texthrolls. Uh, I don't know if you've seen them. They're like pretty mono pose. Uh, I painted eighty of them once. And a load of colours. And I tried really hard with them because my Heresy Army is my army I tried really hard with. And um, lovely. I like, had a great time. I think what was nice about that was there was no pressure. I was like, cool, this is orange 80 times. Like, I've done this before and I'll do it again. Yeah, like, yeah. And then it was like the next colour. And it wasn't like the... the, the you know, like, you, like, go on. Did, did you try and go for that, the classic sort of Forge World style, though, on them? No. Uh, no. no. I, that's, that's something tough. I haven't... Well, I did the base... I've done all the base colours. Like... Um, and then I did, I did like, yeah, I did, I did an okay job on them. Um, but I think that there is room now to like, to, what's nice about some of the stuff that I've seen you guys do, obviously with cold paint, especially the heresy stuff, is you can do all of the, like, making it look realistic after. So you yeah. can paint it, you know, yeah. like you would paint it. And then you can be like, cool, now I'm going to deconstruct this paint job. And I think that's actually kind of nice. And I, I would like to, I was thinking about this literally today. I'd quite like to go back and do that. Yeah. to that army specifically yeah. which would be really fun there's, there's a question nothing- in the chat i, I really want to ask because you keep get, it keep getting asked also big shout out to math Mallow in the chat what an angel uh who didn't know about base uh layer spray cans when he started and so he hand based uh, painted 100 dryads like i've got that yeah i've got that feel i understand uh a question inferno storms keeps asking uh why when you apply a base coat with an airbrush it comes off really easily versus a primer in the can uh because of the chemicals in in the in the so uh does he mean like why does aerosol primer work better than airbrush primer yeah i think so um partly the, the pressure it's going to leave you the the can at um but also just what's what's in it so i or the, the the binders and the fuck what's it called not the binder the, the resin the plastic that they put in it is is different um but I always use aerosol primer. I don't use airbrush primer. And one of the reasons for that is tough, tough primer has like things like polyurethane in it, plastic in it. They all have resin and plastic in them, but it's why you shouldn't lick your brushes and eat your paint. Um, but 
Uh-oh. if that that stuff will go off over time if it's not stored correctly um and i think when it's stored in a pressurized vessel and all the rest of it, it doesn't tend to go off as as quickly as it is in your little bottles that you have in in, in the studio or whatever because they're not necessarily airtight and all the rest of it and you're fine with those airbrush primers over a fairly short space of time and this may have happened before you even bought them if it's been sat on the shelf in the game store for ages um is that the plastic in them will have solidified um, so you end up getting this real spitty, horrible finish uh, and all the rest of it. So I use Citadel Chaos Black Primer. I think it's brilliant. Like it's, it's dearer than most other stuff, but I've never had issues with the weather. Like if it's raining, if it's obviously I spray it in the rain, but if, you know, if it's humid, if it's cold, if it's hot, it's never let me down. And I don't resent paying a bit extra for that, um, that cat comfort knowing it will work uh, and the other one i use is halford's uh gray car primer as well oh there we go some, um, some but yeah it's essentially it's to do with the plastics they use in it um and how they will be applied via the aerosol or via the airbrush we learn every day. We if i listen... put this energy into learning something like medicine or... <laughs> there's, a, there's a load of people in the chat who really care i also care like honestly like you, you learn loads uh, having you on is wonderful it's like so tomorrow we've got mike on um uh, who's one of the naf blood bowl refs oh, right cool. yeah he's awesome a new a new edition of blood bowls out but i don't know anything like I played it like twice, and he's just it's gonna the same, like it's the same game, right? It's su- such a fun game, right? Yeah, super fun. Yeah, yeah. But he's gonna come and talk to us about it tomorrow. And I was gonna be fucking quiet for an hour, pretty much like when I talked to you about painting. But I learn, and that is why we listen. And I can't yeah. thank you enough for coming on the show to teach us and let us. No, no, questions. have a have a chat. <laughs> I had oh. no intentions of teaching you. Oh, like. oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, we got you some chatty take subjects. This information here. that's up to you. You do what you want with it. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to eat my paint. Got it. Nailed yeah. it. I'll make yeah. sure to credit you on the chat. <laughs> uh, listen, it's been lovely having you on. Is there any like shout outs or anything you'd like us to think about before uh, we head out today? I guess if you fancy it, check out the YouTube. It's a good way to see who we are. Uh, check out the website. It's all Cult of Paint. So Instagram, Twitter. I've just started a Twitter account for the business, which is fun. I like Twitter. I think it's a nice hobby space, actually. Quite like the interaction, um, in my experience, anyway. Um, so yeah, just just check out if you're interested. And as always, if you do have questions to do with what we do, just drop us a message because it's me at the other end answering it. So I don't mind. Like gives me gives me something to do right when I'm not trying to figure out how the fuck Kickstarter works. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and if you're interested in the Kickstarter, we will be putting late pledges up soon, so you can jump in on that and get all the exclusive goodness. There you go. There you go. Listen, listen. I, I, I can't, oh, and support I can't... your local hobby stores during lockdown. Buy, buy your paints and buy your models and things from your local hobby stores. It's really Agreed. important. Uh, so many of them are going under. I need some way to teach classes. Yeah, <laughs> and also when, <laughs> when you get the opportunity to, and if you feel it's safe, go and attend an event like at again a local hobby store uh, especially i think that would be really nice uh, henry it's a pleasure having you on the show you're, oh, you're a gentleman and a scholar uh specifically so thank you so so much uh twitch chat love you loads tomorrow don't forget we are talking to mike about blood bowl it's gonna be really fun uh super fun and then uh tomorrow night we've got a special guest in is on the show so we're going to be talking about death watch and space wolves so loads of stuff it's a it's a pretty fun week so but thanks for joining us thanks to everyone on the small game patreon thank you to everyone who listens to the podcast please do stay hydrated uh henry you're an angel we'll talk to you soon have a nice day